There's 20 seconds of activity out in front of uh, our church here at 300 Winterberry Drive. And um, actually, camera's not facing the busiest street. But um, I just wanted you to keep your eye on that. Um, there's a lot of things happening around here. And uh, a lot of traffic passed here every single minute of the day. Um, and I just want us to be aware of that. A lot of people notice us here. And I think we've got a really important mission uh, in this community, in this neighborhood. I've always believed that. Uh, so I hope we can work together on that. Now you've still probably got your Bible in your hand and you're thinking about what are we going to talk about in 1 Peter chapter 1 today. And it's a chapter that... Uh, we refer to a lot in various ways and um, it's kind of where some of our Christian sayings come from that maybe are good and maybe aren't so good but just before we get there I want you to think about a question that I used to ask quite a lot I stopped asking it for a long time and and then I kind of think I should rethink the question but it's a greeting it's a greeting that we use and we just kind of throw it out there for no other reason than just to break the ice or open the conversation. But here's the greeting. How are you? It's an inter interesting greeting, isn't it? Uh, oftentimes, uh, I know people who follow it with the answer. I'm sure you don't do this. Maybe you do. How are you? Okay? Uh, sort of like offering the answer that you're looking for when someone asks you, how are you? I have a friend. I call him a friend. I think he'd call me a friend. He used to be my boss. And um, he had an interesting way of asking that question. And uh, if he hears this, um, I'm not trying to be offensive in any way, but he would offer this answer. How are you? All right? Like asking you the question but not giving you time to answer and then offering the answer that they're looking for so i'm asking you today on this day how are you we're going to think about the things that happen in our life that bring us to a place of you being able to answer that question i stopped asking the question for a number of years when I was working in uh, the uh, Hamilton Wentworth Detention Center, I found that the question didn't really fit the place. The people that I worked with for a long time uh, were not all right. Their life had fallen apart. The things in their world had come undone to a place where many of us, probably most of us, perhaps all of us this morning, have never experienced. And so the question really wasn't even proper to ask. How are you? Peter talked to us in First Peter about the things that would shape an answer to that kind of a question. And you remember the words, and we're just going to work our way down through them this morning, but um, you remember the words. I've entitled um, the first verse. I put a little title ahead of it, and I wrote the word trials. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Now you're probably going to get to know by now that I really do enjoy the New King James Version and I know there's lots of versions out there and we're going to consult all of them. I hope the version that you have is somewhat close to that. But we sometimes misinterpret this. We sometimes lay it down in a way that says, you know, in the tough times of life you should rejoice. That's really not what Peter's saying. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. But he hasn't talked about those trials yet. What he's talking about is the hope that we talked about last week that he talks about in the first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 1 that we're rejoicing 
in the hope that you and I have that has made the resurrection of Jesus Christ ours. That experience of him being raised from death to newness of life, that is our experience. And that is the rejoicing point. I really don't believe in any way that Peter or anyone would be asking you or me to rejoice in trials that are grievous to us. Let's think about that verse for just a moment because he says, uh, you're rejoicing in hope, however, now, though, he says, though now, for a little while, and when he says a little while, what I think he wants us to think about is that we need to compare the brevity of our trial period to eternity. Not even to just the lifetime that you and I will live, whether that's a few years or a lot of years, uh, 80, 90, 100, uh, Sue's aunt is uh, 101. Um, no, I, it's not that time. He's saying, though now for a little while, so a little while compared to eternity is what he wants us to think about. And then he says, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, if need be. I, I want us to think about that as well as we think about why trials, and we're going to think about that even more, why trials come our way. What is the purpose of it, if need be? Now, I want you to remember that God, our Father, doesn't inflict us with pain. However, pain, a very real part of living life on this lump of dirt, the earth, as wonderful and amazing as it is, comes with trials. When you think about trials, when you think about, if I was to ask you that question, you know, what's been your biggest trial just lately? I don't know that you'd have to think too far, would you? It's pandemic. Who ever imagined a year and a half, two years ago, that you and I would encounter a world pandemic that has stopped the world and its movement and its economy and its, and its resources in its tracks? I, rem I know that I've thought a few times about how in the world <laughs> with all of the medical science that we've got at our fingertips, could we not resolve this in a couple of weeks? Do you remember? The pandemic hit, the lockdown took place. I know, I was thinking, yeah, I guess I'll probably be off work for a couple of weeks. Things will slow down a little bit. Well, here we are. Here we are, July of 2021. We're still not through this trials. Uh, that's a trial that's, you know, faced the whole world, uh, the world has faced. But what about some other trials that perhaps you've had to face? Things that you know so deeply well, things that have, things that have changed your course of life, changed your, your trajectory of life, adjusted you in such a way that your life will never be the same. You'll never be on the same track trials, grievous trials. For a little while, Peter says, sometimes those trials can seem awfully long. I don't want us to skip over the words, if need be. It, it points us, it points us towards the next verse where Peter attempts to help us in that grievous time uh, to understand something of how God might use that trial, which he has not inflicted upon us because he loves us, but he can step into with us whatever that trial, whatever that trial might be. So many of you, having lived life, are living testimonies of how God can step into 
a very tough time in your life and draw very close and bring all of the peace and comfort that only, only he could bring through his spirit, through Jesus, through his presence with you. Grief is an emotion. We'll talk about that when we get to the close of this little talk. So Peter moves on and gives us something of the purpose of trials, the purpose of trouble. <laughs> Saw a bumper sticker or a sticker on the window of a car just recently. I snapped a shot of it. Maybe I'll get a chance to show it to you on a PowerPoint someday. But it said this, the trouble with trouble is that it sometimes starts out as fun. I've met those people. I've met those people. Trouble. What's the purpose of it? When it comes in your life, when trials come in your life, what does it mean? How do we interpret it? Peter moves on through this verse and says that these various trials that you have found grievous are found in your life and my life, allowed to be in your life and my life, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ah, that's a mouthful, I know. We're listen we listen to a song uh, that we we sing and we we enjoy um, purify my heart let me be as gold and precious silver refiner's fire my heart's one desire an amazing song that really does speak deep into your heart but i want us to focus on peter's words about trials and the purpose and he uses this term that they that they are there that the genuineness of your faith and he describes the value of faith and he uses uh, an illustration about uh, that points to to gold to that precious metal gold um, I'm not sure what the uh, what the stock value of gold is uh, today uh, but I do know that it goes up and down and here and there and that it's a very important uh, benchmark, I suppose, on the stock market. But Peter takes that uh, precious metal and applies it as an illustration of your faith. And he tells us that the trials in our life are there that the genuineness of your faith, that is the, the value, yes, but the, the fact that it is real. Can we use probably a poor grammatical term and say the realness, the realness of your faith? Now, if you've got your Bible in your hand, I want you to do something for me, if you would. I want you to take your thumb and I want you to place it over the part that is spoken after he says those words, that the genuineness of your faith block that out the part where he talks about gold is because you could almost put those words in parentheses you could almost put them in a bracket he talks about the genuineness of your faith and then just like me sometimes he catches another thought he's distracted just for a millisecond <laughs> pretty distracting to speak to you with all of the activity around our church here today he says that the genuineness of your faith and if you if you just press pause on that whole gold illustration it says this that the genuineness of your faith remember we're talking about the purpose of trials that the genuineness of your faith may be found to the praise honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ you see when you and I stand at the judgment throne that is the thing that's going to matter how are you in your faith could be the question I believe he's gonna ask us how is your faith I believe he might ask you that question that some of the more spiritual among us might ask even today how are you in your soul very good questions very good questions and for you to think about the answer is a very good process 
You see, that is the purpose of trouble and trial in your life. Oh, you can, you can allow it to just overwhelm you and cause you to be despondent and dis depressed. I know, and it's, it happens. It happens. It's real. But if you really seek out the purpose of trouble in your life, it is designed. It is God's way of stepping into that time in your life and refining your faith. I love the illustration uh, about the precious metal and, uh, the, and gold, but I want you to hear this, and it's a, maybe it's a good sermon for you or for me for another time, but it won't work today. I know there are amazing ways of extracting precious metal from the ground these days and getting it from its raw state to a place where it can be turned into some uh, jewelry, a, a gold ring or a gold necklace or silver. But in ancient days, the goldsmith was much more uh, simple. Uh, the process was much simpler. The goldsmith would subject that raw piece of gold with all kinds of other things, impurities in it, to fire, heat it up. And they would heat it up until they could see the reflection of their face in the precious metal and at that moment at that moment they knew that the refining process was complete can you let that sink in just for a moment the goldsmith capital g goldsmith allows the refining process in you until he can see his reflection in your life. Another sermon for another day. But the testing process is to develop the genuineness of your faith. Well, times of testing, as I've already referred, adjust our journey. They take us sometimes in a different direction. Troubles in our life can change the, the direction that we're going. And sometimes those troubles come without a moment's notice. This week, and we'll need to be praying for these folks up in Barrie, this week there was a tornado touchdown for a matter of seconds in Barrie. Changed the trajectory of numerous, numerous families' lives in that town. Events such as that can absolutely adjust the direction of our journey. The refining of your faith is going to be the determining of whether you're turning towards Him or away from Him. And I want us to understand that that, that whole troubled testing time is a process. It's not a moment. It's not a one-shot thing. God continues to allow us to live in this world and be tested and tested and refined and refined. Verse 8 says, we need to intentionally turn towards Him in those times. It says that you, your faith may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, who, whom, having not seen, the Greek uh, suggests having not had a glimpse of Him with your naked eye, you love. So even though you don't see him in the midst of your trial, you need to remember your love for Christ. And how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, he goes on and says, though you don't see him now, now. Remember, this isn't some future event. God is with you now in the very moment of that trial. So even though now you don't see him, yet believing, see, it's about your faith you rejoice. Now, how do we see Him? How do we believe in Him? Well, it's by His Holy Spirit and by the Word. We're going to talk about that very briefly as I close in a few moments. It says that through that trial, even though you don't see Him now, you believe and rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I want you to think about the last time that you were overcome with joy. I can kind of remember it. It happened after the fact. 
We had been uh, locked down, I think the first time. We'd been isolated from our kids and our grandkids. We'd seen them by way of you know, Skype and FaceTime. But that first encounter, that first encounter, where I was actually able to go and see them and speak to them face to face, not at, at that point, do you remember, not allowed to touch, not allowed to have physical contact, six feet apart. I remember driving away from that moment, overcome with joy, tears, weeping, that we were able to, to once again encounter each other. You've seen it at the airport. Do you remember the airport? <laughs> You've seen it at the airport when loved ones come together to see each other for the first time in many, many years or many, many months. Tears of joy. That's the emotion that Peter is getting at here when he says, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the trial, when you see him, when you're able to see him in that moment, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, unspeakable, overcome, full of glory. And that is praise, isn't it? And that is worship probably running out of time here but I want you to think through worship worship can never become an exercise worship is always always designed to take you to a place a deep place where you encounter Jesus Oh, that we would never allow worship to be a, an exercise that we just go through and say the words and sing the tune and wait for the next one to come. Allow those words, allow that music, allow that tune to go deep. I'm going to share a song with you at the end of our service today that's gone deep with me. One of the lines in it says, What's true in the light is still true in the dark deep in my soul that line well we've gone from trials to testing we've gone from testing to tears of joy from tears of joy I want you to go to touchdown not much of a football fan although I love uh, watching it I don't completely understand the game and I, I'm um, at a little bit of a loss and I'll confess this up front I was born in I was born south of the border, so I'm a bit more of a fan of the American way of doing football than the Canadian, but don't hold that against me if you don't mind. Uh, I wasn't there long, a couple of years. I'm as Canadian as they come. But I've entitled this last verse, Touchdown, because it seems to me this is the end of the game for you and for me. It points towards the end of the life that we will spend here on this earth, this piece of ground, this place where we've been placed. He goes on, here he says, that you would rejoice in those trials and tear, with tears of joy, with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We've looked at the genuineness of your faith. It happens during that testing time. Well, at the end of this little section, he points towards that day when you and I will stand in the presence of Jesus. And I believe he'll ask you a question. I believe he'll have some questions. And the questions very well may be about the genuineness of your faith. Next week, we're going to look at salvation and what does it mean. We might step out of first peter a little bit to capture some of those uh, those thoughts but you see this life that you and i live through trials and testing hopefully towards tears of joy as we encounter him in the midst of that testing all about the refining of our faith refining us that at the end of your faith You'll stand before him confident, saved. Salvation is yours. Now, just as I close, now don't expect this every week. 
I had a bit of a reaction to the list that I shared last week and I thought it was worth one more. Don't expect it every week, but here it is. Five ways that you could deepen your faith. And we've talked about them. You can deepen your understanding about faith. And that's kind of what we've been doing this morning. You can develop deep convictions. Things that matter in your life, unshakable things in your life. Develop those. It's really what Peter's been talking about, isn't it? As we refine the genuineness of our faith. Uncover deep emotions. Uncovering deep emotions is the times that we go through those grievous times. It's grief. It's an emotion. We shouldn't just swallow it down and bury it. As you go deep in your faith, as you go deep in worship, don't be afraid of emotion. Cultivate deep relationships. Oh, it's been a test, hasn't it, through COVID, to, to maintain deep relationships when you can't see people face to face, you can't touch them, you can't hug them. In the church, we must develop, cultivate deep relationships. And the last experience deep love from Jesus, from one another, in the church, in your family, in the community. Friends, may God be with you in these days. In a moment, in a moment, uh, when we go back to live, we're going to pray. God bless you.